everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So today we're gonna to finish up our unit here on the revolutionary mindset. We're going to specifically be talking about uh, what had to take place for America to accept a the Constitution, which is a strong central government, which the Americans were very much not a fan of after the Revolutionary War because it reminded them too much of England. Well, now they realize they're going to have to accept it, and there's going to be some compromises made by both sides in order to create and accept the Constitution that we currently have today. Cool stuff to talk about. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. So yesterday we had talked about there being Federalist and Anti-Federalist. Federalists were people who supported this new Constitution this new way of running society to get rid of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the Federalists are generally the people that were at the Constitutional Convention, and then they take out their fantastic Constitution, uh, this document that they made, and they try to convince all 13 states to throw out the Articles of Confederation and accept the new one. The problem is that uh, the Anti-Federalists pointed out very quickly, if we're going to have a central government, which a lot of people were concerned with, all right, because it had been abused in their minds under the British rule, there needs to be a lot of fail-safes built into the Constitution that prevents the government from violating individual rights, which is something that was talked about very heavily in the Articles of Confederation, uh, something that was talked very heavily about in the Declaration of Independence, uh, basically to make sure that the government can't negatively impact individual liberties. So. Everybody scampers back uh, and starts coming up with these changes to the Constitution. Famously, uh, the changes are collectively referred to as the Bill of Rights. There's going to be 10 changes to the Constitution, all right, really before it ever fully gets implemented. There is a guy named James Madison here. All right. James Madison is actually the one that's responsible for writing these. And he actually goes and, you know, like, all right, somebody go write them and then, then we'll talk about them. James Madison actually has 17 um, different um, amendments that he writes, suggestions on what to add to the Constitution, all of which deal with the rights of individual people. Uh, they, there's only one they actually completely reject is one that gets added here one of the last ones that got added uh, is about congressional pay, uh, and that got uh, added in the 90s. Anyway, in the, in the 1990s, it was like 200 years later, like that was a good idea by James Madison. Uh, all the other ones dealt with uh, the rights of people and things the government can't take away from them. The Bill of Rights is massively important because it's the protection that the government puts on themselves to prevent themselves from being able to take away individual liberties. Uh, so the Bill of Rights uh, is incredibly important. And the Bill of Rights is the, is a, is the first 10 amendments. We're going to talk about next unit in depth, each individual amendment and what it stood for. But here it's important to understand that before the American people would accept the Constitution, there had to be rules placed inside it that protected their individual liberties. That's called the Bill of Rights. Uh, so the question here is, what is the Bill of Rights and why is it so massively important to daily life in America? What did it protect? Uh, and so pause me and answer that. It's kind of, you know, abstract concept there uh, because in the next unit we'll talk in depth about the specific things that each one of these amendments did. But generally speaking, what was important about the Bill of Rights? So answer that and we're moving on. So once the uh, Bill of Rights gets added, all right, uh, or they're actually in the process of getting it added, uh, there's still a lot of people who aren't sure whether or not we should commit to a strong central government. There are some very famous papers, because we all love reading essays. Uh, when, when your entire livelihood and existence and knowledge of government is kind of on the line, eh, they were pretty popular. There's a whole group of essays written by the Federalist, and they were like put together in like a book and distributed among the states, basically explaining what the Constitution is. All right? They're called the Federalist Papers. They're very famous. 
Because just like I've had to sit here and teach you like all this new stuff that the founding fathers come up with off the top of their heads, you know, bringing pieces from Greece and Rome and the enlightened thinkers and checks and balances and electoral college, like all that stuff is just like brand new and made up. So nobody's ever heard of any of that or understands it. The Federalist Papers is basically like the instruction manual, I guess, uh, provided to the American people before they decide whether or not they want to go with the new Constitution or not, that basically explains what the Constitution is, what it can do, and what it can't do. Uh, James Madison, he writes a lot. The same guy that's going to uh, pretty much write the original Bill of Rights, those first 10 amendments, there are actually 17, they condensed most of them down into 10. Uh, he is also going to be one of the writers here of the Federalist Papers. His uh, most famous one, he actually has two here, uh, but his most is, is Federalist Paper Number 10, because there are a lot of them. So it's like in a book and it's like each chapter, it's basically like chapter 10 of the Federalist Papers. Federalist Paper Number 10, uh, he basically says that the idea that democracy is bad and can lead to mob rule is not accurate. What actually happens is when you don't have a democracy and you don't have any control by the people, which is the opposite of a democracy, you end up getting like tyranny, which is like mob rule by one person. Uh, so he actually says that the biggest fear of a democracy, of like what happened in Greece, like to Socrates, uh, thousands of years before this, uh, that, is, that is not a fair assessment of a democracy. That there are checks and balances to make sure that the democracy runs smoothly and that not having a democracy or having a monarch is actually the exact thing everybody's afraid would happen, all right? Like mob rule, but it's with one person. Uh, so that's Federalist number 10. The next one, and James Madison, he's all over the place today, Bill of Rights, Federalist Paper number 10. He co writes Federalist Paper number 51. There's a lot of them uh, with Alexander Hamilton. James Madison. Is, will eventually be a president of the United States. Not surprisingly. He's pivotal here at the Constitution. Um, in Federalist Paper 51 with Alexander Hamilton, they, since everybody's afraid of a strong central government, he basically lays it out here discussing why checks and balances are necessary, having these three branches of government. He says, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place oblige and control itself. So he's basically saying you have to give the government the power to, you know, control the people that have allowed them to exist while also single-handedly controlling themselves. This is a fancy way of saying we need checks and balances so that they keep an eye on each other because the last thing that we can have, and we all agree to this, is a corrupt central government. Uh, he has a, uh, James Madison here, has a very uh, famous quote here that says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. What is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? Even the best people around can occasionally be selfish, can do messed up stuff, or those people aren't all good or bad. Is that government's going to be the same thing? Because government's made up of people, especially if it's a government by the people, for the people, run by the people, it's going to make mistakes. We need to have fail safes in place to uh, bring the course back onto the, on the correct trajectory when it gets off course. He's like, you have to have a government because people aren't perfect. When you make a government by people, it's not going to be perfect. And he acknowledges that. This is not the perfect, this is not the divine monarch that people believed in for a long time. He said, we're going to make mistakes. But we have a system of rules and laws that have to be followed to which when mistakes can happen, there's consequences and it brings them back and we have checks and balances. So he, he, he doesn't live in a fantasy world. And I think that really it was important to a lot of people that he didn't present it as this is the greatest thing. I mean, he does. They did say it's pretty awesome. But he's like, we're going to have hiccups. There are going to be problems. That is what happens. This is the best thing that's ever been made by humans so far. But it doesn't mean it's not going to be without its hiccups. But we have it designed to where it should be able to regulate itself following the current Constitution. Uh, the entire purpose of the Federalist Papers was to explain to people what the Constitution was and why it was important and why it's needed and why it's safe. 
this was presented before people accepted the new constitution to basically explain to them why it's okay to vote for it. Because it's a big thing to throw out the Articles of Confederation and come up with the Constitution. So the question is, what was the purpose of the Federalist Papers? And, and was it effective? I mean, I, I would say it, it was. It's kind of an unnecessary second question there because you get uh, your two sentences out of that first one. But was it effective? Well, since we still use it today, I mean, obviously, you know, <laughs> with context clues, yeah, it was effective because people were going to end up voting and accepting the new constitution. So pause me, I answer that completely, and we're moving on. So why? Why did they win? Well, the Federalist Papers, Mr. Wagstaff just said that. Well, that was a big part of it. There's a few other reasons why they won, meaning that we abandon the Articles of Confederation and we go towards the new constitution. Number one, the Articles of Confederation were trash. People knew that. They knew it was a problem. They knew it was ineffective. They knew the inability to tax on a federal level, the inability to have an army. I mean, all that was shown in Shay's Rebellion. It clearly needed to be done away. Like, like massive changes had to be done. So that's one of the reasons that people are going to support the Constitution is because the existing thing clearly has too many problems. The next one is that the Federalists, they are super united, all right? They all wrote the Constitution, they all support it, they came out with the Federalist Papers, you have founding fathers, people famous from the Revolutionary War that helped write the Articles of Confederation, so it's not like it's a separate group talking trash about the Articles of Confederation, it's a lot of times the people who wrote the Articles of Confederation like, hey, so uh, in practice, a lot of the ideas in Articles of Confederation doesn't work and we've learned, and so now that we're not in the middle of a war, we can actually think about this Here's what the best form of government would be for us. So the Federalists were united. They're also famous. People already knew them, like the Federalist Papers in it, and it's like, and here's Alexander Hamilton, a you know uh, important you know officer in the Revolutionary War under George Washington. They didn't have to do that. People knew who Alexander Hamilton was. They knew who James Madison was. They knew who these people were that were writing the Federalist Paper. So they're united. The Anti-Federalists are not. They're all over the place. They're just like, I don't like it. Um, why? It's bad. And they probably have specific reasons, but they're not united. They all have different reasons why they're terrified of a strong central government. They can't really point to any real society that doesn't have a strong central government that's successful, mainly because that doesn't exist. All the other governments have like super strong central governments, like with monarchs. So you can't be like, it's better without a strong central government. And they're like, give me one example of an effective society that doesn't have a central government. And they're like, well, we can be the first, you know. So the anti-federalists were not as united. Uh, they, they didn't have, you know, they, they could have been all over the place. So it was much harder for the, uh, for the federalist to come out and uh, uh, make a solid argument not to go with the Constitution. But honestly, it wasn't just the fact that everybody knew the Articles of Confederation had a problem. It wasn't just the fact that the Federalists are all united and the Anti-Federalists weren't and they're all over the place. Uh, one of the biggest reasons that people are going to accept the Constitution, and it goes pretty smoothly, is uh, George Washington says, it's good. George Washington, uh, uh, super famous at the time. Uh, I mean, the absolute... This is the guy who people have, at this point be like, he single-handedly round kicked, uh, roundhouse kicked France and England in the face of the Revolutionary War with the help of France. Uh, he is the superstar celebrity of the time. Absolutely superstar celebrity. So when George Washington, like, what do you think George Washington? He's like, Constitution, good. People are like, okay, we're good with it now. George Washington says it's okay, let's do it. George Washington had a bunch of power. We're going to talk about that uh, in, in future units uh, over uh, how much power George Washington was offered. Uh, we'll talk about some here in civics and, and, uh, and U.S. history as well. So the question is, why was George Washington's support for the new Constitution so incredibly important for its acceptance? It's, it's a pretty straightforward question here, but, but imagine this. You're like, that seems, how do I answer that? Think about from the other, what happens if George Washington said, that's a bad idea? What do you think would have happened? So, 
Uh, pause me, answer that completely, and, and we're moving on. So something happens as soon as we create the new constitution. Uh, well, one of the first things happened, George Washington sworn in as the first president of the United States. Uh, and he comes in as the president and he has to make a lot of decisions on how this office will operate. All right. Because you have all these checks and balances. Because James Madison had promised in these Federalist Papers that if things get squirrely, then the Constitution has the ability to write itself. That was promised. So George Washington in the executive branch is kind of having to fill it out. The legislative branch, which is the House of Representatives and the Senate, the, the groups that are elected by the people, at least the House of Representatives was at the time, uh, tons of rules on them what they can or can't do. That They have a pretty good instruction book. George Washington is so highly thought of, they're like, you just do whatever you want, George. <laughs> we'll figure it out, all right? So uh, a lot of what George Washington does sets precedents here and there. Um, and luckily, he doesn't abuse his power because that would have caused the whole issue. However, there is something that does happen in the judicial branch that is very important, and it's important enough to talk about here in this unit. We are going to talk about Marbury v. Madison. It is a Supreme Court case pretty much in every single unit here in civics. Uh, so I'm going to go through in the next unit and uh, walk you through step by step what happens in this court case because it is a really cool court case. But the reason it's important here when we talk about the creation of the Constitution, this is 1803, so it's you know about a decade after the Constitution's in place. Madison had promised people if the government does something wrong, it can correct itself. Well, there's all these checks and balances everywhere. An issue arises in which the Congress, the legislative branch, passes a law that clearly violates the Constitution. They, they pass a law called the Alien and Sedition Acts uh, under John Adams, the second president. Uh, and the Alien and Sedition Acts basically said, if you talk trash about the government, you go to jail. Well, wait a minute. That goes against the Constitution. There's an amendment in the Constitution that says you have the freedom of speech. You can talk trash about the government. You can't go to jail for that. But then the legislative branch, Congress just passed a law saying you can. Uh, what happens, and it's, and it's a big confusion because there's, who's the referee when it comes to laws? Because we have this rule book, which is the Constitution, but when you break the rules, who's responsible for throwing out that rule that violates the Constitution? Well, uh, there is a Supreme Court case, and it's an interesting court case, but I'm not going to get the details now. That's, that, that'll be next unit. We'll talk about it. The Supreme Court grants themselves the power, and usually when you're a power grab, that's bad. In this case, it makes sense, and it's like one of those things that probably should have been there in the Constitution to begin with to give the Supreme Court this power. The Supreme Court is like, we're the referee. It can't be the executive branch. The executive branch is responsible for carrying out the laws. The legislative branch is for... Uh, uh, the legislative branch is responsible for making the laws. The judicial branch, we our job is to interpret it. So if we interpret it as being against the Constitution, that law does get, gets thrown out. This is a famous court case called Marbury v. Madison, which establishes a concept of judicial review. This is kind of bringing James, uh, James Madison's idea that the government can self-regulate itself to life. The Supreme Court under Marbury v. Madison gets the, the concept of judicial review, which means they get to be the referee on laws. If a law comes out and it's bullcrap, the Supreme Court now has the authority to, to get rid of it. So this adds yet another check and balance, and the Supreme Court actually gives themselves this check and balance after the, the Constitution is already in place. Uh, but by basically keeping a check on both the legislative branch, which is, uh, you know, if the law itself is legitimate, and keeping a check and balance on the executive branch, are they enforcing this law correctly? The judicial review uh, gives the Supreme Court a lot of power to increase the checks and balances so all three branches of government can collectively keep an eye on themselves, keeping it from becoming corrupt. So the question here is, why was the outcome of Marbury v. Madison another version of checks and balances inside the government? Uh, so basically explain why the concept of judicial review is important for the Supreme Court and the creation of laws in the United States. 
So we're going to talk about judicial review in Marbury v. Madison quite a bit. So uh, ho ho the story behind it is uh, kind of crazy when we get into details. But with that being said, this is as far as we're going to get. Hope you guys enjoyed it.